right, fantastic. Hey, hey, y'all, I just wanna welcome you. My name is John Hart. I am the coordinator of Concat Nation Convention. Um, we have had a great year. We have called this the slow con because we started in October, November-ish and have just been running stuff ever since then. Thank you for helping make it be such a uh, successful year this year. I think we've, through all of our different methods, we've probably reached about 1200 people this year. So it's been a phenomenal uh, year for us. Um, this is our capstone event, as I was referring to earlier, and we're so pleased um, to have Monique here and talk with us about the science and science fiction in Frankenstein. But I wanted to take a minute before we get to the program to thank all of the people that have helped us this year. And I just wanted to thank um, the Jackson District Library, uh, Jackson College's Business and Marketing Department, Ed Cabarro from Ye Old Throat Punch Games, um, Nostalgia Inc., and who else am I forgetting? Oh, the, L the uh, Ella Sharp Planetarium. Yep. So those folks have really given us a lot of support and help promote our events. And please, if you hear those businesses or see those businesses, go visit them because uh, they've been the kind of the blood of getting our word out for us this year. Um, I, would I would thank Facebook, but they're stealing my data. So it's okay. I'm not going to thank Facebook. All right. But before we get to um, Monique, I'm going to let the professors introduce themselves. Steve Tucky, give us, say hello to everybody. Hey, everybody. My name is Steve Tucky. I teach at Jackson College in the uh, science department and in the math department. And uh, along with Steve Albie Scott, um, I'm one of two uh, of three uh, endowed chair um, um, faculty at the college, which is kind of unusual for a smaller two-year college. And one of the cool parts of our job is that we get to kind of put on community-focused uh, outreach events, and Concatenation Convention really grew out of that. We've been doing it for a couple of years. We've had the uh, just immense pleasure of working with people from comics, from movies, from art, from you know, all walks of life, but also from uh, different science disciplines. And so it's been a real hoot to be able to to uh, kind of experience that and share that with the community and, and open our doors at the college, but also open up community doors and allow people uh, access to things that they normally wouldn't. And it's completely free to the community. That's why we do this. We love doing it. And we love supporting science and kind of the interface of science and science fiction. So thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Take it away, Steve. Well, my name is Stephen Albee Scott, and as Steve was saying, I'm also a professor at Jackson College. I'm the Wilbur, Wilbur, Wilbur L. Dungy Endowed Chair in the Sciences, but I'm just a certified nerd, really. And what I really, I get excited by all the stuff we do in Concatenation Convention, because basically it's where we bring that creativity that is involved in most scientific endeavors and really highlight how science fiction and the process of creativity has illustrated um, what Stephen Hawking has done and what uh, Walter Mosley has done and all of these wonderful both writers and scientists and artists and just all of the milieu that we usually uh, deal with um, that makes science fun, which a lot of people don't realize that it is really just a blast to be a scientist. It's not usually, you know, dissecting the frog that you usually do in high school biology. It's actually a lot more than that. All right. Back to you, John. <laughs> Right, and I just wanted to take one more t a minute to thank all of our speakers. And what I wanted to let you know is most of them, you can go and see them on our website, which is jxnconcon.org, jacksonconcon.org. And they kind of live there in perpetuity. So you are welcome to recheck stuff out or try to crack our code, you know, whatever you want to do. So um, at this point, I'm going to take a minute and introduce um, uh, Dr. Monique Morgan and just talk a little bit about her uh, credentials and then kind of where she's coming from in this whole deal. And we learned some cool things about her when you're we chatting with her in the green room before we started. So maybe she'll throw some of that stuff out there, but she has a PhD in English from Stanford University and a BA in physics and astronomy and astrophysics from Harvard University. And see, I'm always saying people are like, oh, it's just the guys and we're all professors. I'm like, no, no, I don't have a BA in physics. Okay, um, and Monique's areas of focus are romantic and Victorian poetry and prose fiction. And then she also includes uh, interest in narrative theory, poetics, literature, and science, and science fiction. And she is always concerned with the literary form and how it influences readers' intellectual, ethical, and emotional responses, and how it interacts with different kinds of forms across genres, media, and disciplines. Her first book was Narrative Means and Lyrical Lyric Ends from 2009, which examined a variety of strategies 
through which four 19th century long poems put narrative techniques into the service of lyric purpose. Her latest work is Narrative and Epistemology in Victorian Science Fiction, which draws upon discussions of methodology in a range of scientific fields to argue that many 19th century science fiction novels expose and defamiliarize the patterns of inquiry that underpin both narrative form and scientific investigation. And we came about um, learning about Monique because she was a part of the humanities in Indiana where they did a whole panel about Frankenstein. And so she comes to us through that. So uh, from here, let's welcome Monique Morgan. So go ahead, Monique. All right. Um, well, thank you all. Uh, I'd like to thank John Hart, Steve Tucky, and Stephen Albee Scott for organizing this convention and for inviting me to participate. I am very pleased to be here. Um, and thanks to everyone who's attending today. I look forward to our conversation. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I have some PowerPoint slides, which will hopefully work okay. Okay. All right, so Frankenstein is over 200 years old and Mary Shelley's novel has been reanimated numerous times in various media from horror films to comedy to camp to children's Halloween decorations. The image of Frankenstein in popular culture is often a shambling green skinned giant with neck bolts who grunts more than he speaks. <laughs> Mary Shelley's novel does depict the monster as eight feet tall uh, but all the other details are different. The creature is swift and nimble, and he speaks very eloquently. And of course, in Shelley's novel, Frankenstein is the name of a scientist. His creature remains nameless. Today, I'd like to bring us back to Mary Shelley's and to discuss two important influences on her novel, early 19th century science and previous works of literature. The novel was grounded in the biology, chemistry, and physics of its time, but it also incorporated and transformed both philosophical questions and imagined scenarios from myths, novels, and poems. By thinking about these contexts, I hope to highlight Frankenstein as a work of science fiction rather than horror, and offer a better understanding of why Frankenstein continues to raise important and complex questions about science and society. So there's been considerable debate about how best to define the genre of science fiction. One prominent camp claims that both science fiction and fantasy depict imagined differences from the author's actual world, but science fiction creates those differences through a plausible seeming extension of existing, in science, of existing science and technology. As Michael McClintock uh, concisely phrases it, in fantasy, magic works. In science fiction, technology does. Frankenstein is sometimes considered a foundational text in science fiction, with some labeling it the first science fiction novel in English. But that view is far from unanimous. H.G. Wells claimed that his own use of science to create strange new worlds distinguished his novels from what came before. Wells said, hitherto the fantastic element was brought in by magic. Frankenstein even uses some jiggery pokery magic to animate his artificial monster. Several decades later, uh, in an introduction to an edition of Frankenstein that was published in 1974, James Rieger objected, the technological plausibility that is essential to science fiction is not even pretended at here. The science fiction writer says, in effect, since X has been experimentally proven or theoretically postulated, why can be achieved by the following carefully documented operation. Um, Mary Shelley skips to the outcome and asks if why had been achieved by whatever means, what would be the moral consequences? In other words, she skips the science. In a later edition of the novel, D.L. MacDonald and Kathleen Scherf responded to Rieger with these obvious but important points. Quote, it is true that Victor does not reveal the secret of life to Walton for two excellent reasons, because he has come to realize that it is too dangerous and because Mary Shelley herself did not know what it was, end quote. So I, I agree with those two objections. I'd like to offer different responses to Rieger's uh, qualms about the novel. So first I'll be arguing that Shelley's novel does feature technological plausibility based on ideas that had been experimentally proven or theoretically postulated. 
but they are often implied rather than explicit and require some knowledge of romantic era science to recognize. Second, I'd like to suggest that to understand fully what would be the moral consequences, we should recognize the importance of the mythology, philosophy, poetry, and novels that influenced Frankenstein. So scholars have discovered compelling evidence that romantic era science provided Mary Shelley with a foundation for the possibility, the method, and the goal for Frankenstein's experiment. And in discussing these scientific contexts, I'm indebted to the work of Anne Malore, Laura Otis, McDonald and Scherf, and, and many others. In Percy Shelley's preface to Frankenstein, he claims, the event on which this fiction is founded has been supposed by Dr. Darwin and some of the physiological writers of Germany as not of impossible occurrence. Percy Shelley is not referring to Charles Darwin, who was only eight years old when Frankenstein was published, but instead to Charles's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, a famous botanist and poet who thought that simple forms of life could spontaneously generate from inanimate matter. He suggested that all animals descended from an original filament, which began through chemical processes and contained a power for self-organization, growth, and development. This is relevant for Frankenstein because, as Brian Aldous points out, the concept of Frankenstein rests on the quasi-evolutionary idea that God is remote or absent from creation. Man, therefore, is free to create his own sub-life. This was in accord with Erasmus Darwin's statement that evolution, once it had begun, continued to progress by its own inherent activity, and so without divine intervention. We can see that Erasmus Darwin thus stands as father figure over the first real science fiction novel. And that's the end of the Aldous quotes. There is another important connection between Erasmus Darwin and Victor Frankenstein. Darwin was a vitalist. That is, he believed that, in the words of Denise Gigante, life actually constructed the very means by which it carried on its very processes, that life was a power independent of structure. And some vitalists thought that the principle of life was a power that behaved much like electricity. So Erasmus Darwin himself strongly hints at this in his poem, The Botanic Garden. In part one, The Economy of Vegetation, he likens the ether or the vital fluid that moves organisms to the electricity of lightning. And here are some heroic couplets by Erasmus Darwin. Starts the quick ether through the fiber trains of dancing arteries and of tingling veins, goads each fine nerve with new sensation thrilled, bends the reluctant limbs with power unwilled, palsy's cold hands the fierce concussion own, and life clings trembling on her tottering throne. So from dark clouds, the playful lightning springs, rives the firm oak or prints the fairy rings. So the notion that electricity or something very like it could goad each nerve, bend limbs and provide a new sensation was an idea shared by more than just Erasmus Darwin. In the same year that Darwin published The Economy of Nature, 1791, Luigi Galvani published De Viribus Electricitatis, which claimed that electricity flows in animals from the nerves to the muscles and causes the muscles to contract. Galvani discusses slaughtering and preparing animals by connecting them to an early form of an electrical battery to produce muscular contractions after death. He called the force responsible animal electricity, but it came to be called galvanism after its discoverer. Mary Shelley would have known about galvanic experiments, not they were widely reported in the newspapers, but also because she likely discussed them with Dr. John Polidori. Polidori had witnessed galvanic, galvanic demonstrations in Edinburgh, and he was one of Shelley's companions in Geneva and a rival in the ghost story competition that inspired Shelley to write Frankenstein. In her introduction to the 1831 edition of the novel, Mary Shelley acknowledged animal electricity as an inspiration. Perhaps a corpse would be reanimated. Galvanism had given a token of such things. Galvanism had become well-known, even notorious, in large part because Galvani's nephew, Giovanni Aldini, toured Europe to demonstrate his uncle's discovery. Aldini connected a voltaic pile, an early form of battery, to recently slaughtered animals and produced motion in a dog's body, a frog's legs, and an ox's head. 
He became infamous in January 1803 when he performed galvanic experiments on the body of the murderer George Forster shortly after he had been executed by hanging at Newgate Prison. According to an account published in the Newgate Calendar, on the first application of the process to the face, the jaws of the deceased criminal began to quiver and the adjoining muscles were horribly contorted and one eye was actually opened. In the subsequent part of the process, the right hand was raised and clenched and the legs and thighs were set in motion. The author of this account scoffs, some of the uninformed bystanders thought that the wretched man was on the eve of being restored to life, an impossibility given the violence with which he was hung. Yet he then claims that in cases of drowning or suffocation, galvanism promised to be of the utmost use by reviving the action of the lungs and thereby rekindling the expiring spark of vitality. Rekindling the expiring spark of vitality. This language describing the vital principle of life as a spark of electricity also occurs in Mary Shelley's novel. Victor speaks of infusing a spark of being into his creation and the creature wishes he had never been given the spark of existence which Victor had so wantonly bestowed. This spark is more than a figure of speech. As a teenager, Victor, Victor witnesses an oak tree destroyed by lightning, which spurs his interest in electricity and prompts his father to demonstrate various electrical experiments. There are ample hints in Shelley's novel to justify so many filmmakers' decisions to depict lightning and electrical apparatuses as the means by which Frankenstein animates his creature. In one of the electrical experiments that Victor father performs, he uses a kite and a wire to draw down an electrical charge from the clouds. This was a decisive moment in Victor's education, and it inspired him to study modern science. According to Victor, this last stroke completed the overthrow of Cornelius Agrippa, Albertus Magnus, and Paracelsus. So long reigned the lords of my imagination. The three authors Victor here names were alchemists who used flawed occult methods to pursue impossible grandiose goals, such as the creation of a philosopher's stone familiar to readers of Potter. And these are the chocolate frog cards for two of the three alchemists that Victor mentions. Uh, it supposedly, alchemy supposedly um, enabled one to transmute base metals into gold or more relevantly for Frankenstein to prolong life indefinitely. As Paul Alcon has noted, by depicting Victor as rejecting alchemy in favor of modern science, Mary Shelley shifts her novel out of Gothic fantasy and into the emerging genre of science fiction. Victor also enacts the progress of science as it was described by the respected chemist Humphrey Davy. In his 1802 discourse, Introductory to a Course of Lectures on Chemistry, Davy he warned that alchemy had encouraged delusive goals and ineffective methods. For a long while, the means of obtaining earthly immortality were sought for amidst the unhealthy vapors of the alchemist's laboratory. These views of things have passed away and a new science has gradually arisen. The phenomena of electricity have been developed. The lightnings have been taken from the clouds and last, a new influence has been discovered which has enabled man to produce from combinations of dead matter effects which were formerly occasioned by animal organs. Influence is of course galvanism. And once again, electricity is aligned with a vitality to end. Davy further praises the accomplishments of modern science, which has bestowed upon man powers which may almost be called creative which have enabled him to modify and change the beings surrounded him. So Davy's description of modern science then provides a template for Victor Frankenstein's goals of revitalizing dead matter and becoming the creator of a new species. Davy's rhetoric also influences the novel and both Victor and his professor of Waldman echo some of Davy's specific phrases. Davy complains that not contented with what is found upon the surface of the earth, man has penetrated into her and has even searched the bottom of the ocean. He also reprimands scientists that engage in speculation ungrounded in fact, and says that instead of slowly endeavoring to lift up the veil concealing the wonderful phenomena of living nature, 
full of ardent imaginations, they have vainly and presumptuously attempted to tear it asunder. In both cases, Davies' metaphors portray nature as a vulnerable woman penetrated and exposed by male scientists. These same metaphors appear in the revised 1831 edition of Shelley's novel. Victor says that thus far, the most learned philosopher had only partially unveiled the face of nature, something that Victor wishes to surpass. I've described myself, Victor says, as always having been imbued with a fervent longing to penetrate the secrets of nature. Both Davies' rhetoric of exposing nature and his claim that modern chemistry supersedes alchemy are echoed in Professor Waldman's lecture on chemistry, which Victor attends. Waldman declares, the ancient teachers of this science, that is alchemists, promised impossibilities and performed nothing. The modern masters promise very little. They know that metals cannot be transmuted and that the elixir of life is a chimera. But these philosophers have indeed performed miracles they penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Shelley presents both Victor and his instructor as acutely aware of the differences between modern science and occult practices. And Shelley uses the language of actual scientists to articulate the powers and goals of science. So I wanna pause for a moment to remind you where I started in this talk with James Rieger's objection that Frankenstein does not qualify as science fiction because Mary Shelley skips to the outcome and asks if why had been achieved by whatever means, what would be the moral consequences? In other words, she skips the science. So I hope that I've just demonstrated that Shelley did not skip the science. It may be present in hints that aren't easily legible to 21st century audiences, but it is there. I do agree with Rieger, though, that Shelley focuses much of her attention on the moral consequences of Victor's experiment. The novel raises several persistent, difficult questions. How should scientists balance the suffering of their test subjects with the well being of society? What responsibilities do parents have toward their children? How much of a child's behavior can be attributed to his or her parents? What is the origin of destructive behavior? Are some people born with a propensity toward violence? Or is violent behavior a reaction to mistreatment by society? So Shelley raises these questions, but I don't think the novel offers any straightforward answers to them. In searching for answers, it is useful to keep in mind that Shelley's story is told through three different narrators. The creature tells his story to Victor, who in turn tells the creature's story and his own story to the Arctic explorer, Robert Walton, who in turn writes the whole thing down in letters to his sister. In other words, much of the story is told through two or three layers of subjective narration, through characters who each have their own purposes in telling their stories. If we want to get an undistorted perspective from the author herself, virtually the only place we can look is the prefatory material before the novel proper starts. That is, we can look to the title page and the dedication page. So these pages contain at least three important bits of information, pointing us to three sources that inspired the novel. The subtitle mentions the myth of Prometheus. The epigraph is from John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost. And the dedication is to William Godwin, author of Political Justice and Caleb Williams. And these literary precursors have drawn considerable attention from critics and they provide context for some of the novel's most important themes creation, parenthood, and free will versus determinism. So maybe I'll just pause for a second to ask if any questions have arisen in the chat since this is the transition away from the science and towards the fiction part of the talk. We've had a couple. Um, one that, that popped up or kind of early on when you were talking about uh, the, the language of electrification. And, and it was very, I, I, to, to my ears, it sounded very romanticized. The idea of electrification is this sort of romantic endeavor. And I mean that in the kind of the, the literature sense. Is that, was that a, a purposeful thing? Or was that just the, the water that she was swimming in at the time? That was the way people thought about electricity as this kind of like, ooh, this really special thing. 
Yeah, well, um, you know, Galvani and some others, uh, including Erasmus Darwin, certainly speculated that this might be the key to life, right? That this might be what transforms otherwise inanimate matter into something self-moving, purposive, right? That, that, that it might be the very essence of life itself, right? Yeah. So that's certainly, you know, kind of mind blowing and, and uh, was very inspirational to many. Um, this is also, a, a, and some of you hosting this event will know more about this than I do, but this is also a period when there's a, a series of developing experiments that start to understand the sort of um, the possibility of transforming energy from one state to another, right? So it's it's the gradual birth of thermodynamics, right? Yeah. And so that's also something that's in the process of happening that uh, is beginning to be understood. Um, even something like, you know, the finite amount of energy that's available in say the sun is something yeah. that people are beginning to speculate on and, and poem about, right? Yeah. So there's a lot going on um, in the science of the time to make electricity seem incredibly exciting, right? And, and, and to be clear- And in terms of the romantic, um, you know, Mary Shelley is herself a romantic writer, as I'll mention later, she's the daughter of, of two authors as well. Um, she's spending her time when she's writing this novel, hanging out with Percy Shelley and Lord Byron. <laughs> so like she is, she is living the romantic era life um, in a sort of quintessential way. Uh, so the, there's a lot that is going into this, yeah. And and she's how old at the time? Nineteen. When she's writing this. Uh, she's a teenager. Yeah. She's yeah. maybe eighteen, and it's nineteen when she's published. It That's blows your mind. Well, yep. I was I was going to kind of spin off of that, Monique. Is when you said that um, Erasmus Darwin said the filament. Is he is in what? meaning for that time is he referring to the filament is he saying the threat of life what is he saying there i guess i'm curious to know the context of it so i i think um what likely happened was some of uh, it, the concept that he called it is spontaneous generation right like the idea that life can spontaneously generate from inanimate matter right and the experiments that he did, like retrospectively, we now realize that he started with contaminated materials, right? So he, he, I think he began with like flour, maybe flour and water and kept it in a jar. And then there would be like a small worm-like living organism that would develop, right? And so I, I think filaments tend to refer to these very small worm-like organisms, right? which he thinks are spontaneously generating, but actually there must have been some contamination of, you know, like an egg or a cyst or whatever it was. Um, but then, yeah, I think it was flower weevils. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, I think filament of life probably refers to like microscopic or very small organisms of worms. Yeah, because I just think it, well, when, you know, now that I'm looking at it in hindsight, you're like filament? Like that's what we talk about with electricity, right? We have electrical filaments and other small tubules and that kind of stuff. And then I'm like, wow. So like, you know, I, so it's just catching me. I knew it wasn't quite that, but it was just kind of a neat uh, confluence there. So I appreciate it. The other, the other science question uh, I had was uh, you talked about uh, kind of vitalism kind of comes up as sort of a, a, an idea, a way of thinking about kind of life and the, the origin and the nature of life. And that seemed to be, uh, they, they were focused on kind of the breath of life. And so the, the lungs were very important in, in the, the prediction that maybe this would help start the lungs to do their work, to fill with breath of life. Does that mean that they, you know, and I, I don't know as much about this, uh, but does that mean that they were not terribly interested in the role of the heart or the brain? I mean, they, they had some idea of, of what the, the blood flow did, but this was before, is this before Gilbert? I think this is before Gilbert. Yeah, this is before Gilbert. So were they not thinking about the, the heart and the brain nearly as much? Uh, and it was really about the lungs and kind of the effects of electricity on starting the lungs and breathing and the, the, the importance of breath? Um, I guess I'll answer this in two ways. And both are, well, the, the first answer is tentative, right? 
So I, I do think that they had an understanding about like the brain and the spinal cord, they understood about the heart and you know, the lungs were also important. I think in the context of this uh, particular discussion of the galvanic experiments on the recently hung murderer, um, the speculation that it would be helpful in uh, drowning victims, I think there the idea is uh, that, that the drowning would be a less violent death than hanging, right? Uh... And um, that in many cases, people are rescued uh, relatively soon after they enter the water, right? That because there would be a potentially a small window between when aid was given and when they might have died, that this might be a, a way to bring them back. Um, Monique, can I interject for a second? And, and you have to think about when originally before CPR, as you were indicating, Stephen, it's one of these situations where they would say that if someone was drowning, you gave them the breath of life by breathing into their mouth. And so they didn't really connect it with actual heart. It's more of the life was in the air. We talked about the humors a little bit in the chat, but I think that's kind of where he was, what was going on there, I think. And to, to tie it into sort of romantic era um, literature, I mean, inspiration is connected both to like breath of life, but also poetic inspiration, right? And, um, and so they, romantic era poets love to use metaphors of the wind as inspiration, right? Percy Shelley's Ode to the West Wind or you know, Coleridge will talk about the wind going over the strings of an aeolian lute or an aeolian harp, that the wind itself can create music. Uh, you know, bird song is often a, a standard motif in romantic literature for natural art that is you know, breath and expression um, but non-human, right? So uh, certainly inspiration has a connection to like literal inspiring, respiring, um, and, and then is connected to more spiritual things as well, right? To the inspiration of the muses or uh, a pantheistic connection to the vitality and spirituality that pervades all of the natural world. Remember at the time that um, people studied science to study God's plan. I mean, that's the primary reason during, when Mary Shelley was starting this stuff that you are a natural philosopher. So Darwin was actually going to be a preacher before he went on his, his, you know, his voyages. But um, the idea is that you were studying the perfection of God and, and the breath of life and air and all the humors and all the things we're talking about is basically scientists trying to understand God's plan which is really what we're talking about. It's sort of a different perspective, I think, because we're in the you know, 21st century, we're trying to think about a perspective that was, was completely foreign to what we, how we think today, I think is a big issue. Yep. And, and Todd brings up, you know, from Genesis, which they all would have been steeped in. It's a, it's a, it's, it is Ruah in Hebrew. God's breath is the thing that brings Adam from the Adma, the dirt into human beings. So conversely to take life from one is to take their breath. So literally Todd, you just took my breath away with that. That was, no, that was good. Thank you. Sorry. I, I, I'm curious to see how this goes in terms of looking at the, the literature side of things. So, well, And that's a perfect transition because I was is. about to bring up creation myths. So, <laughs> um, okay, so bringing in some of the uh, literary uh, influences, um, as you'll see hopefully on this title page, the, the title and the subtitle are Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. So in Greek mythology, Prometheus is a titan who stole fire from the gods and gave it to man. His name means forethought, and in some classical texts, he is responsible for bestowing upon humanity all the arts and sciences, all their means for survival and advancement. Other versions of the myth claim that Prometheus created man from clay. So Shelley's choice of subtitle aligns Victor with Prometheus on the basis of their status as creators, their mastery of technology, and their orientations toward the future. All of these qualities would seem to cast Victor in positive light. But Prometheus is also known as a trickster and as an overreacher. In one of Hesiod's tales, Zeus punished Prometheus for his transgression 
by tying him to a mountain and sending an eagle to feed on his liver each day. Every night, Prometheus's liver would grow back so that the next day the eagle could eat it all over again. A cycle of unending torment. And again, Victor aligns with Prometheus. Victor suffers intensely and uninterruptedly after animating the creature. After Victor's first conversation with a creature who demands a female companion, Victor says, sometimes a kind of insanity possessed me. I saw continually about me a multitude of filthy animals inflicting on me incessant torture that often extorted screams and bitter groans, a description that resembles Prometheus's torture by the eagle. And one of Hesiod's other tales, Zeus punishes humanity for Prometheus's theft of fire by sending the woman Pandora. Despite Prometheus's warnings, his brother Epimetheus marries Pandora, who opens a jar and unleashes onto humanity disease, strenuous work, and other evils. As Charles E. Robinson has observed, the etymology of the name Prometheus, forethought, is ironic. Victor lacks forethought and fails to understand the destructive consequences of his actions. In this respect, Victor more closely resembles Epimetheus, whose name means hindsight or afterthought. The subtitles reference to Prometheus then reinforces Victor Frankenstein's status as a creator who defies the divine order, but does not give us clear guidance on how to judge his act of creation. Was it a gift or a curse as destructive as Pandora's box? Um, so, and that's an image of Prometheus and another uh, creation stories evoked by the novel's epigraph. Did I request thee maker from my clay to mold me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? These lines from John Milton's Paradise Lost are spoken by Adam to God after Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree of knowledge and fallen into sin. Obviously, Christianity portrays God as benevolent in his acts of creation. It is unclear, though, if the reference to Paradise Lost is meant to reinforce the idea that Victor's actions stemmed from benevolent intentions, or to suggest that Victor tried to usurp God's role as creator. The specific quotation from Paradise Lost, though, is spoken by Adam and aligns with the creature's viewpoint, not Victor's. Neither Adam nor the creature had any choice in his own origin, and this leads us to the novel's preoccupation with free will versus determinism. Is the creature responsible for freely choosing his murderous actions? If not, is the creature innately evil by nature, or did his mistreatment make him a monster? Paradise Lost suggests that people act freely. One of Milton's chief preoccupations in justifying the ways of God to man is reconciling God's foreknowledge with man's free will. Milton has God himself say of Adam, I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. Within Shelley's novel, the characters reach different conclusions. At times, Victor expresses uncertainty about the origin of the creature's destructive behavior. More often though, Victor uses terms like monster, fiend, or demon that suggest the creature is irredeemably evil. The creature offers another interpretation of his behavior and he articulates it with the help of Paradise Lost, one of three books he discovers in the forest and reads as though it were a true history. So in his first conversation with Victor, the creature implores, remember that I am thy creature. I ought to be thy Adam but I am rather the fallen angel whom thou drivest from joy for no misdeed. Everywhere I see bliss from which I alone am irrevocably excluded. I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. Make me happy and I shall again be virtuous. The creature states his case for social determinism as clearly as possible. Misery made me a fiend. Make me happy and I will be virtuous. His initial mistreatment and exclusion was unjust, he claims. He was ostracized for no misdeed. In a more just world, the creature would be as loved and favored by Victor as Adam was by God. Instead, the creature identifies with the sufferings of the fallen angel, Satan. 
Comparing himself to the literal devil may not seem like an effective way for the creature to convince Victor that he deserves better treatment and is capable of behaving benevolently. But within Mary Shelley's social circle and cultural moment, there was a radical re-evaluation of Milton's Satan. In the years during and after the French Revolution, some British radicals saw Satan as emblematic of the suffering of those oppressed by powerful and unrelenting authority. Three of the most canonical English Romantic poets contributed to this positive re-evaluation of Satan. In The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, William Blake has a devil proclaim, the reason Milton wrote in fetters, in chains, when he wrote of angels and God, and at liberty, one of devils in hell, is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. Satan also inspired Lord Byron, the most famous, famous poet of his time and one of the other competitors in the ghost story competition with Mary Shelley. Byron created a character type now known as the Byronic hero, a proud, brooding, endlessly fascinating figure modeled in part on Satan. So Satan's pride and self-torment are very prominent in Milton's Paradise Lost, in which Satan delivers dialogue like, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. And the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. So Byron endowed the heroes of many of his poems with these traits, portrayed himself as sharing them and became an overnight sensation. And third, Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley's husband, used the figure of Satan for overtly political reasons. In his preface to Prometheus Unbound, Percy Shelley describes Satan as having courage and majesty and firm and patient opposition to omnipotent force. And he labels Satan the hero of Paradise Lost. He warns though, that the character of Satan might tempt the reader to weigh his faults with the wrongs against him and to excuse the former because the latter exceed all measure. When Victor Frankenstein's creation compares himself to Milton's Satan, he does so at a cultural moment that sympathizes with Satan's courageous and majestic rebellion against authority and pities his suffering, which exceeds all measure. Milton thought of Satan as freely choosing to rebel and hence deserving of punishment, but Milton's romantic era readers, including the creature, thought Satan experienced such harsh and unrelenting punishment that he was justified in rebelling against it. Milton emphasized free will, but the creature draws on the romantic sympathy for the devil to emphasize social determinism. The idea of social determinism is strongly reinforced by the novel's dedication to William Godwin, author of Political Justice, Caleb Williams, etc. Sorry, I just had some problem with my, there we go, okay. Um, so uh, in William Godwin's Enquiry Concerning Political Justice, uh, it was one of the most radically, uh, one of the most politically radical texts of its time. Um, he claims that moral judgments should be the product of disinterested reasoning and should be guided by utilitarian calculations of what will best benefit society. If people were disinterested and rational, government would be unnecessary. Within a flawed system that requires government, however, our actions are the necessary consequences of political structures and social conditions, or so Godwin argued. He goes so far as to say of a murderer and the knife he uses, that the one is no more free than the other as to its employment. So a really extreme statement of social determinism. The context of Godwin's political justice then would seem to reinforce the creature's claim that misery made him a fiend. Godwin's novel, Caleb Williams, however, provides a more ambiguous precedent for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So Caleb Williams is a Gothic novel full of hidden secrets, malevolent forces, and a vulnerable and persecuted protagonist. The title character is a poor man who both adores his employer Falkland and discovers Falkland's Caleb and Falkland act as gothic doubles whose fates and flaws are intertwined, with Caleb first pursuing Falkland's dangerous secret, then Falkland pursuing and persecuting Caleb. Mary Shelley develops a similar shifting power dynamic between Victor Frankenstein and his creature. 
The creature tracks down Victor and follows him across Europe, but later Victor tracks and chases the creature toward the Arctic. Initially, Victor holds the power of life and death over the creature and over his possible female companion. But later the creature brings death to Victor's friends and family and pushes Victor himself to exhaustion and death. Victor articulates the unnervingly close and destructive connection between himself and his creature, and he does so in explicitly Gothic terms. I considered the being whom I had cast among mankind and endowed with a will and power to affect purposes of horror, nearly in the light of my own vampire, my own spirit let loose from the grave and forced to destroy all that was dear to me. And later Victor thinks, I, not indeed, but in effect, was the true murderer. These quotes suggest that the root of the creature's evil behavior lies within Victor, but they leave unstated if the problem is Victor's experiment itself or his abandonment of the creature afterward. Both quotations are in response to the creature's first murder of Victor's youngest brother, William. So the creature's first victim then shares a first name with William Godwin. And this is especially striking because William Godwin was Mary Shelley's father from whom she had become estranged when she eloped with Percy Shelley. The novel is obsessed with the influence of parents and with the consequences of their absence or neglect. Dedicating this text to her estranged father may be Mary Shelley's attempt at reconciliation, but the naming of the creature's first victim seems more an act of passive aggression. So how does this all add up? The subtitle and the epigraph refer to mythological and biblical acts of creation, but the benevolent intentions of the creator figures are offset by Prometheus's status as an overreacher punished for his transgression and by Adam's complaint that he did not ask for God to make him, nor we might infer did he ask for his suffering and expulsion from Eden. Eden. The epigraph from Paradise Lost refers to a text that argues for humanity's free will and choice, but the dedication to the author of political justice points to a text that argues for people's behavior as socially determined by their conditions and treatment. Both a reference to Caleb Williams and Mary Shelley's own relationship to William Godwin suggests complicated dynamics of dependence and guilt. This prefatory material, as Paul Cantor notes, points to an underlying moral ambiguity. In other words, the title page and dedication page guide us toward the novel's central thematic and moral questions, but give us contradictory suggestions about how to answer them. So informed readers of Frankenstein then are given an abundance of cultural context and precedents to guide their interpretations of events, though this guidance is often contradictory. Our interpretive situation is the opposite of the creature's when he first awakens to sentience. The creature has absolutely no prior knowledge to guide him. And this leads me to the last influence on Mary Shelley that I wanna talk about today, David Hume's empiricist philosophy. When the creature first awakens and explores the forest, his mind is a blank slate, and he must learn the causes of what seem to us the most obvious phenomena. The creature says, I was delighted when I first discovered that a pleasant sound, which often saluted my ears, proceeded from the throat of little winged creatures. Soon after, he can distinguish among types of little winged animals. I found that the sparrow uttered none but harsh notes, whilst those of the blackbird and thrush were sweet and enticing. When the creature first encounters a campfire, he thrust his hand into the live embers, but quickly drew it out again with a cry of pain. Later, he tries to master fire. After unsuccessfully trying to ignite wet wood, the creature notices the wet wood, which I had placed near the heat, dried and itself became inflamed. By touching the various branches, I discovered the cause. The creature acquires his earliest knowledge not through formal education, nor from innate ideas, but rather through the process of induction. The creature notes, perpetual attention and time explain to me many appearances which were at first enigmatic. So he emphasizes the repeated empirical observations necessary for induction. In this depiction, Mary Shelley draws upon and supports a long line of English and Scottish philosophy that emphasized empirical observation of outward phenomena 
rather than intuitions from innate ideas. They emphasized induction rather than deduction and materialism rather than idealism. I argue, however, that Shelley was responding to a particular text in this tradition. Shelley literalizes and expands upon a thought experiment proposed by David Hume in An Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding, a thought experiment that was meant to illustrate that, all, uh, that we all infer causation through our sensory experience of the constant conjunction of two things. So Hume writes, suppose a person though endowed with the strongest faculties of reason and reflection to be brought on a sudden into this world. He would indeed immediately observe a continual succession of objects and one event following another, but he would not at first by any reasoning be able to reach the idea of cause and effect. Nor is it reasonable to conclude merely because one event in one instance precedes another that therefore the one is the cause, the other the effect. Their conjunction may be arbitrary. Suppose again that he has acquired more experience and has lived so long in the world as to observe similar objects or events to be constantly joined together. What is the consequence of this experience? He immediately infers the existence of one object from the appearance of the other. So Hume's hypothetical situation, I think perfectly describes how Frankenstein's creature is brought on a sudden into the world, endowed from the start with the strongest faculties of reason and reflection, and yet devoid of experience. As Hume predicts, the creature is eventually able to infer cause and effect once he has acquired more experience. The creature applies his inductive skills to many more phenomena than fire though, as he explores the forest outside Ingolstadt, stays in the de Lacy's hovel and travels to Geneva to find Victor. He spends his time near the de Lacy's watching and endeavoring to discover the motives which influence their actions. Eventually he learns enough to contrast Agatha with the area's other inhabitants. The girl was young and of gentle demeanor, unlike what I have since found cottagers and farmhouse servants to be. Soon the creature is able to supplement his own observations with a vicarious education as he watches and overhears Felix de Lacy's lessons to safety. But the creature keeps his fresh viewpoint on what Europeans take for granted. The creature says, the strange system of human society was explained to me. I heard of the division of property, of immense wealth and squalid poverty, of rank, descent, and noble blood. The words induced me to turn towards myself. I learned that the possessions most esteemed by your fellow creatures were high and unsullied descent united with riches. Without either, he was considered a vagabond and a slave doomed to waste his powers for the profit of a chosen few. Because the creature finds the division of property, the exploitation of labor, and the prestige of aristocracy to be strange, Mary Shelley's readers are encouraged to examine them with fresh eyes, to find them strange and unjust. And this is a process called defamiliarization, um, in which something that is usually left unexamined is reframed in such a way that we can no longer take it for granted. It is made suddenly unfamiliar and open to scrutiny. And this process is central to the genre of science fiction for those critics who define science fiction based not so much on its extension of existing science and technology, but rather on its production of cognitive estrangement. So in his influential book, Metamorphoses of Science Fiction, Darko Suvin, who I think has a name that just is born for somebody to write about science fiction, so Darko Suvin claims science fiction then is a literary genre whose necessary and sufficient conditions are the presence and interaction of estrangement and cognition, and whose main formal device is an imaginative framework alternative to the author's empirical environment. And I'm gonna unpack that statement a little bit. So the imaginative framework that is different than the author's world is the new element, the extension of existing technology, or in some cases, an alternative political system, think dystopian fiction. In Shelley's novel, it's obviously Victor's ability to animate dead matter and create new life. For Suvin, the crucial aspect of science fiction is the use it makes of this imagined new development. The author and reader treat the change cognitively as something rational and governed by rules, though those rules will differ somewhat from the rules of our world. 
the alternate set of rules is itself strange, but even more importantly, it defamiliarizes the rules of our world. We are forced to recognize them as one possibility among many. So as Paul Alcon explains these dynamics, part of the game for readers of science fiction is to infer, often from minor and sometimes apparently contradictory details slipped in without further explanation, the principles, whether a physical law, technological practices, or social customs that govern an imagined world. By playing this game and comparing the imagined world to our own, there will be induced in readers both heightened awareness of physical or social arrangements in our world that we ordinarily take for granted and a questioning of those arrangements. So to bring the discussion back to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, readers can infer from minor details that she drew on an early 19th century understanding of physical laws and technological practices to imagine new scientific possibilities. Figures like Erasmus Darwin, Luigi Galvani, and Humphrey Davy helped her construct a fictional world based on a modified set of scientific principles. The contradictory details on the title page and dedication, the references to Prometheus, Paradise Lost, and William Godwin, helped Shelley explore the moral principles and philosophical questions central to her novel and to our world. But it is the creature's experience that allows Shelley to question social arrangements in our world. The creature's unusual perspective and isolated situation invite readers to consider how society treats other outcasts and misfits and how it treats the poor and underprivileged. Science fiction presents an alternate world in order to defamiliarize our own world. But Mary Shelley pushes this even further. The creature's story presents some of our most obvious, most taken for granted knowledge as though it were a source of surprise, wonder, and fear. The creature must actively learn that birds sing and that fire burns. And he does so through repeated observation and inductive reasoning. Shelley's novel defamiliarizes the reasoning process that both underpins our everyday interactions with the world and grounds the scientific method. Frankenstein is not only a foundational work of science fiction that produces cognitive estrangement, it also estranges cognition itself and defamiliarizes the science so crucial to science fiction. Thank you. That was very so nice. Cool. Loved yeah, it. That is very cool. Yeah. So I'm yeah, happy I to field any questions that might be out there. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We were just commenting on, yeah, that, that idea I think is what really drew me to science fiction. And I think I go something back to something that Steve, a bold claim that Stephen L.B. Scott said, right? Is that uh, lots of science or modern science fiction tropes come from Star Trek. And I think that one of the reasons I really like Star Trek is it does so defamiliarize you and allows you to see something, a different future that could be rather than what is painfully going on during the 60s, right? All the, all of the um, uh, social problems, racism and structural racism. So I think that science fiction really frees you because you can see a bunch of different stuff and really um, you know, think about all of the possibilities. And I think that Frankenstein for me has always been that, the, especially the book where you have this creature that is really not as ugly or isn't um, simple or anything like that, almost beautiful. Like, I think, what do they say in the, in the book? Terrifyingly beautiful, right? And so the, the um, yeah, this idea of this, uh, almost like the Superman is what Frankenstein, the creature is, and that he's, that he's able to kind of um, see everything differently is not this huge form, you know, doesn't really mean to do harm, but does harm because he doesn't have control of his emotions, doesn't understand what he's doing, just like you said in the, in the Milton quote. So, you know, I've always seen him as a very different character than in the film. And I don't think that anybody's ever really captured the creature or the whole like, the experiment of Frankenstein really adequately as what it is in the book. It, it, I mean, I, they really tried in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but the creature comes off so terribly versus what it's described in the book. So they kind of get it half right. <laughs> so I totally agree. It's like that whole 
underlying science about, you know, saying the very specifics is heavily there because it's philosophy of science and life, and especially couched in um, uh, alchemy. And that's a very interesting thing that um, I'm a big Mike Minola fan who did Hellboy. And his whole thing is this same thing, like, what's the real world? What's the dome world? What's the um, spark of life? What's the beginning? What's the end? All these kind of things. And that fix that that whole thing ends up being, right, of specially making a different whole human species through these all these underlying alchemic <laughs> principles, basically, you know, going back way to like 18, 1700 science. So I really appreciate it. It, it caught me on so many levels of why I love science fiction and why I love that book in particular. And, um, and, and I saw the Dory and a couple of those illustrations and it made me think of uh, uh, Bernie Wrightson, who was like the guy that drew Franken, he drew a Frankenstein that is beautiful. And it, it's very more matched. It's the only element that I've ever really seen where I thought the creature looked correctly and that he interpreted kind of what was happening scientifically as well. So um, thanks for bringing it up. It's so, uh, so rich on so many levels. Well, and I also think that, you know, I, I really appreciate the idea of you talking about Hume because I, I don't, I haven't said this, well, I have said this before, you know, I actually have a BA in philosophy. That's where I started. I'd studied philosophy of science. And one of the things that I found interesting or fascinating about science fiction is this plausibility uh, idea that, you know, it, it, we do gloss over the science because we really don't understand, you know, like warp drive. I was making the comment about that earlier is this idea that um, the world isn't what we think it is. And it's actually much greater than our experience, which allows us to have that excitement for the future. And, and, and that's, that's where science fiction gives us that plausibility. It's also like this idea of, you know, what is reality now that we know you know Planck's constant basically tells us that the reality of the world is digital which throws us into this whole entirely different idea that our entire universe is actually a created thing and it goes back to the creation myth which a lot of people you know scientists go oh man how can you possibly go back in that direction when in fact um that's kind of the way science fiction and science is leading us and it all started with mary shelley now Remember, when we're talking about Mary Shelley and we're creation myths and, and the belief structures of science, she's as progressive scientifically and in a science fiction context that we have as Star Trek today. And I think we, that's what I meant when I, we talk about the his, history of, of Mary Shelley and what she, what she was experiencing. Is it is, a lot of it is political commentary. Um, but it's also a lot of science fiction political commentary. And I did make a comment about uh, Milton, you know, so uh, Percy Shelley was a big Milton fan, as you were saying, but the anti mil or the Milton critics used to put the, the Milton um, fans into, um, into satanic groups. They called them Satanists. When in rea reality, they were just do doing the sort of humanistic or David Hume response to uh, the empiricism of the moment, which I always find it fascinating. And I really am surprised that Mary Shelley at 18, 19 wrote a book like this, because this is a pretty dangerous bit of work for a young woman of the time. I mean, I, I'm really, it, it floors me that we don't realize how brave she actually was. I mean, this is the time that people were getting flogged and put to death for any anti, you know, Christian sort of beliefs when, you know, it, basically where life came from and, and how all this went down. It was very, I really enjoyed your presentation because it gave us that perspective that we don't normally think of when we're talking about Frankenstein. So thank you. I, I enjoyed it too. I, I'm going to ask a question that came up in the, the chat cool. for you. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, Randy says, do you feel the synthetic character of David, who is played by Michael Fassbender in the movie Prometheus? I don't know if you've seen that, if you had a chance to see it. It was from the alien um, Ridley Scott. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and he was also in Alien Covenant. Do you feel that he's more in alignment with the roots of Mary Shelley's creature? Uh, and because he there, he says there appears to be a deep introspective analysis on his part in regard to his role within the universe and his ability to transcend the mortal restrictions mm -hmm. of his creator. And so what, do, what are your thoughts on that? 
It's a really good question. I will confess that I saw Alien Covenant once, or I saw no, I saw Prometheus once, and I have not seen Alien Covenant. So I'm going to be basing this um, answer on my slightly fuzzy memory of of Prometheus. Obviously, the title of that film ties in really nicely <laughs> with with uh, one of the influences on Frankenstein, and I do think that. Um, a, a lot of science fiction that considers artificial intelligence, you know, including robotic AI, um, is you know almost inevitably influenced by Frankenstein and, and by the creature, right? But I, I would agree that David's character is incredibly curious about his origins, very introspective, um, learns by imitating others as i recall like doesn't he watch lawrence of arabia and yes. sort of imitate, that match uh, scene yeah. yes right so like the trick is not to care about the pain right um <laughs> so so sort of I imitating human behavior by watching someone who doesn't know that they're being watched seems very much like the creature um you know observing behavior of the de Lacy's. Uh, you know, through a, a sort of people in the hovel. Yep. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think, I, I don't have anything especially insightful to say about Prometheus, the, the film, unfortunately, but uh, other than to agree with you that I definitely see that there. And nice. um, I, I think Blade Runner, you know, the, the, uh, the film version um, is, I think very directly influenced by Frankenstein and, um, you know, has, has, uh, you know, the replicant, uh, Batty, Roy Batty, you know, goes to, to meet his maker, right. Yeah. And then violently confronts his maker yeah. in much the way that the creature <laughs> does, um, Victor. So, you know, I, I definitely see a sort of through line there in the work of Ridley Scott. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, and I'll think more about it. I'm it sorry. Is, it's a really good question. I've been thinking um, on the science side of things, on the kind of the scientific uh, endeavor side of things. Do you have you run into any examples of scientists, um, scholars, uh, you know, people who who study science or who do science, who have been influenced and expressly have said that they were influenced by Frankenstein, or maybe like inspired by it, or <laughs> there's that word inspired, or cautioned by it, like it's it's helped kind of tether their aspirations. Uh, have you run into any of that? Um, so I, I have done a little investigation into um, 19th century scientific discussions, right? So I, I've searched databases with some of the scientific periodicals that were published um, in the Victorian period after the publication of Frankenstein. And um, uh, the, Frankenstein does get mentioned several times uh, scattered throughout and it tends to be in the context of people using Frankenstein as shorthand for unintended consequences, right? Like that seems to be how this novel is thought of by, by later 19th century scientists as a cautionary tale about the unintended consequences of, of the destructive unintended consequences of a scientific experiment. Yeah. So that's yeah. by far the, the context in which it most frequently comes up in 19th century discussions by scientists that I've come across so far. Um, the runner up for, uh, for ways that it's mentioned is uh, if, if a scientist is doing a book review of another scientist's publication and the original publication mentions Frankenstein, sometimes the reviewer will scold them like Frankenstein is the name of the scientist, not the creature. <laughs> it, wrong. So it was already a mix up that was common then. And the, you know, brought down the scold of hell. Wow. Mm. Yeah. And, and how Gene often Wilder would say Frankenstein. Frankenstein. <laughs> Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah. What's your, what's your take on the uh, humorous interpretations of Frankenstein? Because I mean, it's a very serious novel. It is just weighed down by seriousness and philosophy, but yet it's also been taken to like absurd extremes. How is that? I mean, literally, literarily, how is that feasible, possible? I just, it's amazing to me. So yeah. what are your thoughts? Um, I guess foundationally, I think that it's such a rich text. It builds on so much that preceded it. It brings up so, so many sort of important topics, 
topics and questions, but as I suggested, it doesn't give us any straightforward answers, right? Like it forces us to think about it. So I think that for me is the main reason that it's been such a rich inspiration for others and so often adapted because there's so much there, but it doesn't box itself in, right? So it's quite mm -hmm. possible to take elements of it and, and reframe it differently. For the more comedic aspects, I mean, I love Young Frankenstein. I like <laughs> that's just such a funny film, and I especially love, um, you know, the the Abby Normal brain. <laughs> like, the, the, I, I got the wrong brain. This is from Abby Normal. Abby and, Normal. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, seeming to go with the, the biological determinism route, right? Like you're, you're born the person that you are, but I love that the film then reverses that, right? By, yep. by having the creature redeemed. Um, and also partly, you know, there's the, the sort of second experiment where, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking. It's not Victor. It's, uh, what is the, the Igor, you mean? Yeah. Igor. No, Igor. The, the Frankenstein, right? No, Frankenstein. The, the oh, yeah, yeah, the son. Yeah, the, the great I grandson or whatever. Yeah. First name is. Anyway, um, so Victor Frankenstein's descendant, right, who, who undertakes this experiment, has a second experiment where he transfers some of his own sort of mm -hmm. uh, brain power or something to the creature. But prior to that, like, he actually tries to nurture the creature, right? Yeah. He tries to raise him. He tries to educate him. You know, he... Um, and, and so that's such a departure from Mary Shelley's text. Oh, yeah. And one that like really gets to me that he, he tries his best to behave responsibly <laughs> towards this, this, this creature that he's made. And so that for me is like the really moving, um, serious part of that film within all of the wonderful comedy. Yeah. yeah I love that well, Igor's deformity. She moves her right over to here. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Well, no, I, I, was, I was thinking about your question is that I think really the biggest thing that makes the comedy possible is because the first Frankenstein by James, James Whalen is really quite good. And actually the Bride of Frankenstein is quite good, but almost every other representation of Frankenstein rip, strips away <laughs> any kind of humanity or seriousness to the point that, you know, it's like Frankenstein and Abbott and Costello. So mm -hmm. it really, I think what makes it do it is like it's shaped, it's it's just the form only. And it's the really, what you had introduced at the beginning, Monique, like the bolts in the neck, really dumb, uh, you know. For, so it's like, get so far away from the philosophy that they could just fill in any wild thing like Hanna-Barbera's young Frankenstein cartoon series and all of that. Um, all of that, all of that stuff. So yeah, and I, I mean, Young Frankenstein definitely um, tries to put it on its head. And like I was going to say too about it, kind of connects how you're talking about how he humanizes the creature. That really is one of the cautionary tales too. Is that if you do stuff with callousness, and that you do it with carelessness and egotism, that it's going to blind you to the consequences of what you are actually doing. Because all they had to do is engage the creature and try to teach him instead of just you know, shunning him, and that that book is totally different, <laughs> right? I mean, really, it's like, oh, he's my son, you know, and I mean, maybe he gets in trouble with the villagers, and he goes and kind of gets in there, but that's not what happened. He's like, get out of here, so just being that that cut loose, and I think, um, like, all those creatures in the alien movies are somewhat alike. They're not, they're just put out there, and they're filled with stuff to do, and you can't really philosophize until you've decided to reject your, what you're maker has just wanted you to do right to come to grips more with your your own humanity or your own being so really cool i love the discussion any any uh last questions anybody from the audience have a question that they want to share and you can share in the chat or if you want to um, unmute yourself you can share that way too give people the requisite 10 seconds of courage building <laughs> Uh, somebody says, could you provide some insight into the writing process Shelley would have used? Good question. Okay. Um, so would she have used a dictionary? Dictionary, uh, interesting. That's a good question because there's a lot of words in there that are... There, there are. Um, 
I, I honestly don't know if a dictionary was among whatever books that they brought with them to Geneva when they were traveling around Europe. Um, I can give you some context for the, the writing process. And if you want a little more background about the ghost story competition, I can speak about that too. Um, so the, the ghost story competition uh, was with Percy, her, they were not yet married then. So they were involved, um, but Percy was married to somebody else at the time when they first <laughs> came involved. And so they, they got married a, a little bit later. Um, at any rate, so uh, Mary Godwin, Percy Shelley, Lord Byron, and John Polidori, Byron's personal physician, uh, decided to have this ghost story competition. And uh, Mary apparently felt a lot of pressure on herself because she was the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, you know, philosopher and novelist, feminist icon, and William Godwin, who then was a very well-known philosopher and novelist. Uh, and, and she wanted to sort of to, to uh, prove her uh, literary lineage, but also hold her own hanging out with like two great poets, right? So she had writer's block for a while. She couldn't come up with a story. And then supposedly one night she had a nightmare. And in the nightmare, it was the scene where um, Victor has just performed his experiment and sort of run away and fallen asleep. Right, and he wakes up in the middle of the night and the creature has pulled the bed curtains aside and is grinning down at him. Right, so that's the moment in the novel that was the, the kernel of the story. That's, that's the nightmare that Mary Shelley had. And she uses that as the basis for building out the rest of the story. And she had a lot to draw on because you know, she was in pretty uh, sort of lofty literary intellectual circles and, and had lots to draw upon. Um, she spent the next several months writing a, a draft of the novel. Um, it seems that Percy did sort of do some editing suggestions here and there um, and wrote a preface for it. Uh, and then she published it anonymously, right? It gets to the issue of how sort of controversial or dangerous it might have been for a woman to publish such potentially scandalous material. Um, it was published anonymously initially. And a lot of people assumed that Percy had written it, right? Um, so that's the, the sort of composition uh, story of, of the novel. Um, interestingly, as another way to tie into science, the reason that they were just hanging out telling ghost stories to each other and then you know, writing ghost stories for each other is because the weather was very bad that summer of 1816. And the reason that it was very bad is because in 1815, Mount Tambora erupted and spewed a bunch of particulates into the atmosphere, which caused temporary global climate change. So the summer of 1816 was unusually wet and cloudy and cold. And there were lots of crop failures um, and a lot of famine. The much less important consequences for the, the Shelley Byron circle was that they couldn't really go outside because the weather was so bad that summer. And so that's why they were stuck indoors telling ghost stories to each other because of climate change, because of a volcano eruption the previous year. One other thing to say about the ghost story competition is uh, the only other person to write a finished product from it was John Polidori, the doctor. The doctor, yeah. Who published a novel called the vampire. And so the vampire figure arguably has its first, you know, its, its first influential origin here in this ghost story competition. And the vampire, uh, Polidori's novel, um, models the title character on Byron. So oh. that vampire is very much an aristocratic Byronic hero figure, right? And, you know, many later vampires have many Byronic elements because of this origin. Uh, but Polidori also published his no novel anonymously and everybody assumed that Byron had written it, right? So it sold <laughs> much better than it otherwise would have because of this assumption. Wow, that is so cool. I, I didn't know that. So Frankenstein's monster and 
the the vampire concepts kind of all kind of had a, a very similar uh time frame for their mm -hmm. their their beginnings mm -hmm. or their popularization at the very least um there, there's a, a point that came up in the chat that i thought was really good uh carrie says this sort of explains the scientific possibility of darth vader's creation from a burned anakin have you have you ever considered that as a connection back to the frankenstein story um really interesting I yeah that is really interesting and i hadn't thought about it before and i guess maybe one reason i hadn't made that connection is because of the memories right like vader uh, still has the memories of his life as anakin he seems uh, to try to ignore them most of the time right like he yeah. he does not behave much like anakin skywalker <laughs> after transformation but eventually luke can redeem him because he still has some connection to that past yeah. whereas you know the the creature is such a blank slate when when he's um reanimated um but i i love the point of like trying to connect sort of darth vader's reanimation to this myth as well um i like that that's so cool well, um, I, thank you so much for taking the time to answer the questions and to, to give us a terrific presentation. This was this was fabulous. And, and thank you for being so generous with your time. I really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. And uh, thank you, John and Steve. Do you want to say anything else before we skedaddle here, John? Oh, you know, I have to flog the promotion horse. Uh, it just so <laughs> happens that we're per we have one more it's going to come now we're going to have some continuing events i just wanted to let you know also thank you um we're probably going to be doing some of the talks that we did with concatenation in the library um once a month at some point starting soon in june we are going to have a drive-in of young frankenstein with the uh, jackson district library um it is slated for the 11th there'll be details coming soon and then just like there was a ghost story competition there we are working on a writing competition of reanimation uh, science fiction with the library, which will be in the fall and it'll be for middle school, high school and college students. And the winners will get a small cash prize and a publication and a chapbook that we will produce as part of this. So look for all those things. I just wanna say Monique, I really super enjoyed it. Um, I love that we had you last because one of my things is I'm a cross connection thinker and I so enjoy all those little little nuggets where they connect. And I had no idea about Erasmus uh, Darwin in that picture. So that was very interesting just to think it kind of comes full circle and he kind of goes and then, you know, the, with uh, what they had thought of evolution kind of coming out of a misconstrued theory, you know, of his grandfather. So that's very interesting. Um, and if you guys, uh, just last thing, and then I'll throw it over to SAS. If you want any of this content, it's up on the jacksonconcon.org um, webpage as you see it there. There'll be a few more selections on the blog post from the library. They've got a lot of good content associated with reanimation. So thank you so much for showing up, letting people know about it. SAS, any last words? So I was just gonna say that I, I think it would help if all of our fans would tell other people about these events. I think it's quite a unique convention. It's one of the, I mean, you know, I go to both nerd conventions and science conventions, and this is where we actually put the two things together. And so I would highly recommend people uh, just tell them about jxnconcon.org. And uh, yeah, there's a Facebook uh, link as well. I think John has that, but I really, I mean, this is, this is just fun. I hope you guys enjoy it. I just, I'm tickled pink every time we do this. And I, I just love it because I love talking about uh, science and science fiction with people that are like-minded. And so I appreciate that everyone's here. So that, those, those are my two cents.